Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from LaRouche Pack with your daily update for July 17th, 2020. As it's Friday today, I'll be taking your questions. And I, I want to thank you. There were lots of questions and we certainly can't get to all of them, but I picked out some that I think get to the heart of the most important issues we're facing today. But let me start with a, a correction from yesterday. Uh, it was pointed out to me that at one point in my discussion of Bill Binney and his role in exposing the fact that there was no Russian hacking, that I confused Binney with Pompeo. Uh, the point I was making was that Binney had a meeting in October 2017 with Pompeo, when Pompeo was CIA director, and he presented his evidence that there was no Russian hack. And yet Pompeo sat on the evidence, never did anything with it. Bill Binney is a hero. He's been fighting to uh, make sure that there's not a collection of metadata on the American people, there's not spying on the American people, and his work on the expose of Russiagate has been absolutely essential toward providing the truth of what's really going on. Pompeo is a war hawk who's out to sabotage President Trump's intentions to put an end to regional wars. Now, someone wrote to me and said, well, how do you know Pompeo didn't do anything uh, with what Binney said? How do you know it's, it's not Pompeo, but Trump who suppressed it? Let me make a simple point. Pompeo was CIA director at the time. Had he gone publicly forward and said that John Brennan, his predecessor at the CIA, is a liar and that Brennan lied about Russia and Russian interference and that he's going to make sure that this story is exposed as a fraud to stop President Trump from working with the Russians. Had Pompeo done that, there would have been no Russia gate. There would have been uh, an end to the whole Mueller operation. Uh, we wouldn't have had patriots like Roger Stone and, and Michael Flynn targeted. But Pompeo did not do that. So don't anyone assume that Pompeo is an honest actor who's doing the right thing. He's someone who should be removed because of his policies. And removing him is not a question of a personal thing. It's changing the policy from geopolitics to cooperation. So I wanted to make that uh, correction from what I said yesterday, and I hope that's clear. Now, there are a number of questions on the economy and Hamilton. Uh, also, someone asked about Andrew Jackson. So let me start with the, the first question was, what did Hamilton mean when he said that debt can be a national blessing? Well, what, when he became Treasury Secretary, there was a huge debt. The equivalent for the United States at that time, in the 1790, 1791, the equivalent to what poor third world countries face today, huge debt, foreign debt. And what Hamilton did was organize a system of production and credit for production that would make the U.S. economy function in such a way that it would produce enough real product to be able to, over time, cover the debt and to reorganize the debt so it could be covered over time. Hamilton's policies were not modeled on the Bank of England, which was essentially a bank controlled by private interests for the benefit of the private interests tied to the crown. Hamilton's national bank was committed to ensuring a distribution of credit to producers, to entrepreneurs, and especially then for the development of a platform of infrastructure that would allow the colonies to bind together as a national economy. And therefore, the idea was that you pay the debt, but you pay it by building and developing a, uh, the productivity of labor. That was Hamilton's whole policy elaborated in his four reports to the Congress. Now, that it worked. The U.S. established a creditworthiness that continued up until the, the last 30 years before we went on a, a huge binge of national debt. Now, Hamilton made another point. Never take on a debt without the means to extinguish it. In other words, don't borrow money on the credit of the people of the United States to bail out speculators. Instead, you must generate credit that goes into something physical, into production. 
And that's the difference between Hamilton's National Bank and the privately controlled Federal Reserve and the European Central Banks. Now, that's the principle that should be applied today. Hamilton was assassinated by a British agent, Aaron Burr. After the killing of Hamilton, where did Burr go? He went to London. He stayed with Jeremy Bentham, who was an operative of the British East India Company, leading the opposition to the United States. Uh, now, that brings me to the second question. Uh, I was asked, what about Andrew Jackson? We're told he was anti-banker, that he was throwing the bankers out, that he was a good guy. Actually, what Andrew Jackson did was attack the National Bank of Hamilton the second national bank. And in doing so, who is he operating with? Aaron Burr was a big supporter of Andrew Jackson. The whole grouping of London bankers threw their lot behind Andrew Jackson. Now, why was that? Jackson didn't know what he was doing. He, he was run largely by Martin Van Buren and another grouping, which included eventually August Belmont, who is the official representative of the Rothschild interests in the United States. And there's a, a fascinating book written by a colleague of ours, Anton Chaitkin, called Treason in America, which details the role of the British in overturning the Hamilton system, working through people like Van Buren, like uh, James Buchanan, and, and even before that with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson's anti-bank populism was promoted by people like Arthur Schlesinger, the historian who wrote the book Age of Jackson, to make him seem like a, a very important American patriot. This would be the equivalent of 50 years from now, someone writing a book on Barack Obama's presidency, saying that Obama opposed the too-big-to-fail banks with the uh, adoption of the Dodd-Frank bill. When anyone who knows anything today knows that Dodd-Frank was part of the bailout process to protect the swindlers and the speculators at the expense of regional banks and banks that loan for, to small and medium businesses. So don't be fooled by saying, someone saying, well, he was anti-bank, or people saying Hamilton's bank was government control over everything. The government did determine credit policy through the Congress. That's what's in the Constitution. The Constitution has no room for private interests controlling the credit generation of the nation. So the Federal Reserve is unconstitutional, and we have to go back to a Hamiltonian system. Now, th this is a, a crucial issue, and I, I would encourage people not to just grab onto populist slogans uh, against big banking. Hamilton's National Bank funded the building of America. It funded entrepreneurs. It funded the development of industry. It was extended by Lincoln's greenback policy, where he, again, generated credit for production, which not only enabled the, the North to win the Civil War, but to come out of this destructive process with a national economy, with the transcontinental rail system, the development of the steel industry, and everything else that was a marvel to the world when they came to see what was being done in the United States at the 1876 centennial. So throw out your uh, populism and actually think through the idea of a government of, by, and for the people, where the people through their elected representatives determine credit policy is what enabled the United States to become a great power not the idea of a free market controlled by the private interests, whether it's the bankers, the insurance companies, big pharma, the corporate cartels. No, it's the American people who have to act. And that's the responsibility we have. Now that gets to another question. What do we have to do to get Glass-Steagall? Well, that's what we have to do. We have to organize a, a, a significant grouping of the American people to call for regulated banking. Now, regulated banking doesn't mean you determine what grade of toilet paper is used in the restrooms of the banks. It means you make sure that banks have a public trust, that people who put their money in banks can be assured that that money is not going to go into speculative bubbles so that your savings and your checking accounts are at risk, as they are right now, because under Dodd-Frank, there's a bail-in provision that banks can take your capital and use it 
as leverage to borrow more money to keep their, their bloated fake assets on their books at face value. So that's the problem with the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999. Glass-Steagall was implemented as one of the first bills of Franklin Roosevelt to protect savers, to, de to protect depositors, to protect the commercial banking system as a means through which credit can be generated for production. Uh, it was a, a separation of the commercial banking system from the speculators, from the investment banks, the JP Morgans and others, who were using their clients' deposits to create their speculative bubble. So that's why Glass-Steagall is so important. Study it, look at the LaRouche's Four Laws on LaRouche Pack website, and then go out and become an apostle of this policy. Fight for it, because this is the constitutional policy which allowed for the development of the United States. Now, a related question. Uh, with all the liquidity pumping, how come there's not been a hyperinflation? Now, the reference was to what happened in Weimar, Germany in 1923. Well, the, we're headed toward that. And for people who don't think there's inflation, just think about this. If you're a little bit older, you probably remember the time when you could get a decent house in the United States for $30,000. Today, and I'm talking about 40 years ago, today that same uh, house is hundreds of thousands of dollars. You pay $40,000 for an automobile. You used to be able to, to get a car. The whole idea of Henry Ford was to make the automobiles, uh, the, the production, cheaper so that the person who works in the factory can afford to buy the product of the factory, one of the cars. Uh, today, that's not really possible the, because of the destruction of the wage scale. So the idea that there's no inflation is a complete fraud. But more importantly, and by the way, that's what they're doing with statistics, but more importantly, when you pump trillions of dollars into a speculative system, you are ultimately going to weaken the value of the dollar to the point where you will have a hyperinflation. Part of the reason it hasn't hit yet is you have not had the series of defaults which will cause the circulation of money that's currently on the books to go into circulation to cover the, the defaults. But we're headed toward defaults. We're headed toward potentially unprecedented levels of evictions because people can't afford rent because of the shutdown of the economy, uh, foreclosures, uh, car repossessions, the calling in of credit card debt. And when that happens, you'll find that there's, there's, even with all these trillions of dollars, there's not enough dollars to cover this, at which point the dollar goes kablooey. So we haven't had it yet because most of the dollars are not going into any form of, of circulation. There are notations on bank books and hedge funds and the shadow banking system that are providing actual purchasing power to the speculators while taking away the purchasing power of the consumer, which supposedly the whole economy today is a consumer economy. Supposedly, we the consumers are supposed to be driving it. Instead, it's debt-driven, debt that's being created by and for the shadow banking system. So that's why we need Glass-Steagall. Uh, let me take one, one final question here. Let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, people ask, what can I do to make sure that Lyndon LaRouche is exonerated. Because we've had the, the very interesting development of the commutation of the sentence of Roger Stone by President Trump. And Roger went on Sean Hannity's show last week. Many of you, I'm sure, saw it. And among the things that he said, besides pointing out that this was nothing but a witch hunt, a hoax, there was no Russian collusion uh, that, that he was involved in or that the president was involved in, and there was no Russian hacking. And this is where the question of Bill Binney came up because Roger wanted to bring in Bill Binney into the courtroom to show the absurdity of the charge that he was somehow, that Roger was somehow connected to a Russian hack and, and getting the, the documents from the Russian hack to the Trump campaign. Well, how could that have been the case when there was no Russian hack? But the judge in the case would not allow Roger to present an affirmative defense. They denied his, his right to bring in Bill Binney to testify. So 
What we're seeing now with Roger's commutation is hopefully he will continue to speak out. I'm sure he will. He's a, he's a very committed American patriot. And with all the slander and, and everything else against him, he has the interests of the American people at heart. But more importantly now, we're seeing troves of documents being released, which show, for example, in the Flynn case, that the FBI knew that Flynn was not guilty of lying. And yet they used that as the basis of launching the witch hunt against him. There's all the evidence coming from the CrowdStrike president, coming even from testimony before the House Intelligence Committee of Brennan, Clapper, and others, admitting they knew nothing about collusion. They had no evidence. There was no evidence they had of Russian hacking. So as this comes out, it makes clear that this was a fraud and a hoax fabricated by people who intended to prevent Trump from pursuing his commitment to ending the endless wars of the military industrial complex. Now go back 40 years. What was the attack on LaRouche? That he was working with President Reagan to ensure that there could be detente with the Soviet Union based on sharing new physical principles that would make nuclear war impotent, nuclear warheads impotent and obsolete. And he was attacked by the British, the FBI, and what we call today the deep state, or essentially the British operations in the United States. He was attacked as a Russian agent and he was uh, subjected to slander and eventually jailing, with Robert Mueller playing a key role in the Get LaRouche task force. So as we move toward a situation where the Russiagate operation is fully exposed, it is imperative that part of the unfinished business of overturning Russiagate is the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche. And why is this especially important? Well, if we're going to have a summit, as President Putin has called for, of the P5, the permanent five members of the UN Security Council, and if President Trump is to be allowed to participate in that, as he has intended from the beginning to, to move toward cooperation with the great powers, then the, it's not just that LaRouche should be exonerated because he was unjustly prosecuted. It's that his ideas have helped to shape the environment in which the whole P5 process can move forward. That is, LaRouche's ideas of global economic development, of physical economy as opposed to speculation, opposition to the neoliberal policies of austerity and protection of private interests over public welfare, over the public good. So LaRouche's ideas are essential, and the fact that he's been vilified was an attempt to marginalize him and keep his ideas out of public discussion. But you know what? His ideas are discussed everywhere by every government that's serious on the planet. And so his exoneration is overdue and must be a part of the rollback of the fraud of the fabricated Russia, Russiagate story. So thank you for your questions. Uh, join me next week and, and make sure you share this video and. And we have uh, more videos up on the LaRouche Pack site and the Schiller Institute site, which will give you ammunition for your organizing. So thanks again, and I'll see you next week.